It's been a long, long road, and my soul is grown so weary. I just can't understand all the struggles within me. There are times I'm straying away, and even times I could not pray. But somehow my faith would say. Just hold on, there's a brighter day. He never gave up. He never gave up. Mercy reached out. That was enough. If you could see. See who I was before, and I'm 
Still the mate that Jesus would pay a debt that I could not afford. And I've never got past that I'm free at last from the sin that made me a slave. I still feel as much as when he first touched me. Oh, yes, I'm still amazed. I'm amazed to know. I'm amazed this stranger would accept the manger in trade for a kingly throne. And I'm still at a loss why he'd take the cross instead of the streets of your gold. He's the only king who gave everything in exchange for a cold, dark grave. I still love to ponder this God-given wonder. Oh, yes, I'm still amazed. I'm amazed to know how far God would put his sin a lost me free. scared of dying, but with morning's light, he finds he's all right. Because of the blood, placed over the door, my sin debt is paid, I'm not afraid anymore. The lamb has been slain. of the 
All right, good morning. Good to see you this morning. Happy uh, Memorial Day. Glad to see everybody here in church. Beautiful day the Lord's given us today for this day. And uh, looking forward to getting started with the Sunday School Hour here in a moment. What are we going to start with singing? Page 252 in your hymn books. Let's lift our voices in song. Page 252. All right, number 252, his banner over me is love. <laughs> Jesus is the rock of my salvation, banner over me is love. Jason is the right, my salvation, banner over me is love. Jesus is the rock of my salvation, banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. One more time. Jesus is the rock of my salvation. Banner over me is love. Jesus is the rock of my salvation. Banner over me is love. Jesus is the rock of my salvation. Banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. And you know, uh, you think about the banner over us is love, and you think, well, who made that up? Well, look at the top of your uh, hymnal there, and it says, He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Solomon's 2 4. So, this is an idea from God Himself written in the Word that His banner over us who love Him is love. And of course, that was expressed by his gift of salvation on that cross of Calvary. Brother Ken, would you open us in prayer? Amen. All right, Pastor. All right. This morning we're going to get right back into looking at some of the young people in the Bible, but uh, before we do that, I'm going to read you a letter uh, from our newest missionary, just a thank you letter before he knew he was our newest missionary. Um, we had missionaries in last Sunday night, we voted on them Wednesday night, and uh, we got this letter in the mail, it says thank you <clears throat> for the opportunity to be with you last Sunday evening, we appreciate the opportunity to share the burden of our call to the Middle East, we enjoyed the fellowship with the church family before and after the service, as well as the time together at Taco Bell. Thank you for the meal provided for us following the service. Thank you for the comfortable place to rest while we were in town. Thank you for the most generous love offering. May God bless you, uh, your charitable hands and hearts with bountiful blessings. Thank you for your interest and for your prayerful consideration for partnering, partnering with us for spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ in the Middle East. There are many daunting tasks before us, and we know that you will be praying as we go forward, pray for our deputation travels, divine safety, divine intervention, divine appointments, divine provision, and for divine strength. Pray for the field ahead of us for contacts that will help with the transition and visa processes for the correct teacher and language school, for wisdom as to where to locate in housing, and for open doors and ministry according to God's plan. May the Lord richly bless you and multiply your efforts to reach Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania with the gospel. We will be praying for your church and for the effectual working of God through each of you. May God provide for you and through you as you give to send the gospel around the world through foreign missions. Thank you for being involved in reaching souls for Christ. Pray on, preach on, press on, four souls in the Middle East. And I won't say their name over the live stream, but uh, their new, newest missionary families, their, their uh, information is up on the missions display board now. We did, I did, I was able to put their... Uh, their video up there, at least for myself to enjoy Friday, but today I went to show Brother Ken and Brother Pete the video, and it doesn't work. 
Uh, so if you want to see that, I can show it to you after the service sometime. Uh, it's there, it's accessible, it's just not in the right place. So I will uh, try and get that fixed. But if you did not see them in person last Sunday night, I would encourage you to watch the video to get an idea of what they're doing, what they're going into. And i uh, thankful that the Lord allowed us to cross paths with them and to pick them up for support. That's our 10th missionary uh, that we support, nine families and one organization, that being First Bible International. And looking forward to what the Lord will have for us in the future when it comes to missions. All right, so to, today in our Sunday School Hour, we're going to look at another young person in the Bible. This one is another bad example. We had a good example last time um, with the damsel and in, in the story of Peter uh, with, with Rhoda there. And uh, today we have a bad example, a bad example. Judges chapter 17 is where we're going to find ourselves. Judges chapter 17. And uh, we're going to look at a story. We looked at this two and a half years ago. I found some notes from two and a half years ago. We, we preached out of this chapter. Uh, I don't know that anybody's going to remember that, so I think we're okay. But, uh, but we're gonna, when we did that a couple of years ago, we looked at some different things. And uh, to, this morning we're going to look uh, more so at the young man that's listed in the chapter. Uh, but in order to do that, we've got to get some background, got to figure out some things of what's going on. Judges chapter 17 We'll start in verse 1, but before we do that, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the time you've given us in the Sunday School Hour to study your word together. Lord, help it to be a help to us in order to allow us to be more like you. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Judges chapter 17 and verse number 1, the Bible says, There was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said unto his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursedst, and spakest of also in mine ears, behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. And when he had restored the eleven hundred shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly de dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son, to make for a graven image and a molten image. Now therefore I will restore it unto thee. Yet he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took two hundred shekels of silver and gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had an house of gods and made an ephod and a teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. Now this, this man Micah, he is a mess. This, this family is a mess. And I read this and I think about just the relationship between mother and son. And I just immediately start thinking about people I've met over the years that, that kind of fit this narrative. There's a few things to know about this family before we meet the young person that's going to come into their lives and essentially make things worse. Uh, and that is, first of all, this man stole from his own mother, stole 1,100 shekels of silver. He's like, hey, mom, you know that, that money that, you've, that you lost that you were cursing about and you talked to me about? I have it. I took it. And her response is, oh, blessed be thou, son of the, son and the Lord. And, and so, so weird situation here. He steals from his mom. He returns the money. We see the intended use. She says, I, I had wholly dedicated that money for the Lord, 1,100 shekels for her son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, we won't turn there for time's sake, but, but can you guess what's in Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5? It's part of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not what? Steal, yes, but make any graven image is what we're thinking about for this one. Yes, because because she says, I'm going to make a graven image for the Lord. And it's amazing to me today to see how what type of things people supposedly do for the Lord. It's like they think sin is okay as long as it's in the name of God. And, and so there's so many things out there today being done in the name of the Lord that God said, don't do, period. Especially don't do in my name. And here this woman is making a, a idol in the name of the Lord, a graven image in the name of the Lord. She dedicates 1,100 shekels to it, but once she loses the money and then gets the money back, she only ends up spending 200 on it. So again, it's just a, an odd thing. It's like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend 1,100 bucks on this, on this idol. And then it's like, oh, I lost my money that was for my idol. And you get it back and it's like, well, I don't really need to spend 1,100 on it. Uh, that money, when that money was gone, that was a big deal. Now it's back and I kind of want to do things with it. So I'm just going to spend 200, 200 shekels on it. So it's, again, just an odd dynamic uh, in this family. She had, uh, he, this man, Micah, had a house 
of gods. Now, little g gods. And, and, that, and that shows that the Lord was not his only God. And that's one of the troubles that you, that you see in different cultures around the world even today when it comes to missions and missionaries going to places. Sometimes uh, you have to be very careful because what people will do is they'll accept Christ in the sense that they are adding him to their other gods. I've, I've, heard, I've heard a couple of different missionaries that have gone to or been from the Philippines, and, and it was funny, there was one guy, he was, he was going to the Philippines, uh, and, and he was talking about how the guy he was meeting up with, they had hundreds and hundreds of people saved all the time and all these different things, and, and, uh, and just you know bragging up on how, how ripe the field was, and that's great. And then the next guy that came in a few months later was, was from the Philippines, had been working there for, for over a decade as a missionary. And he said, yeah, a lot of missionaries will talk about how, uh, and he didn't know that the other guy had been there, but he, he said a lot of missionaries talk about how many people get saved and all that. But what they don't tell you is all they're doing is adding a little Jesus idol to all their other idols. So they're not actually getting saved for the most part. They're just accepting that, hey, I can add this God to my other list of gods and, and I'll be covered in case that's the right God. So he said, you got to be careful because they'll willingly accept it and they'll say, oh, yes, I'm saved. But they don't understand that you have to make him the only God in your life. And so that's where if you're not careful, you know, here in America, we assume that people know that we mean exclusively when we when we talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ, about accepting Christ. that This is neat. This is your one way, the way, the truth, the life. Not every uh, nation, not every culture has that idea. They have polytheistic ideas. They they have several different gods, and so they have no problem accepting another god. And so, got to be careful with that. Now, Micah, he had a house of gods. He had a whole whole bunch of false idols and false gods in this little place that he had built for them. And again, it's just a reminder that when you have gods of your own creation, you're taking care of them. And I'm thankful we have a god that takes care of us. I've seen the pictures of, of the floods in, in the Far East where people are walking around carrying big old statues and idols and trying to get them out of the floodwaters and saving them from the floods. And it's just, it's, it's sad, but it's funny to me to see people literally having a burden on their back that is the, the God that they supposedly worship. And they're, they have to save that God or it's going to get waterlogged and rotted out and it's going to be no good anymore. And so it's just, it just shows the foolishness of all this. But this man, he has a house of gods. Uh, he, he fashioned his own ephod, which is a Greek priest's girdle. He made a teraphim, which is a family idol. He made one of his own sons a priest. Now you you talk about talk about getting getting in a good position with your preacher um, when your son is your priest. That's uh, that's you, you kind of got got the reins there a little bit. You got a little bit of control there. We went to a church one time and visited, and and more than half of the church was one family. And all of the deacons were members of that one family. And I was telling my wife, I was like, this, this, is, this may seem good now, but this could be really bad. <laughs> and sure enough, the church split multiple times, and now there's only a couple people left there. But, but the, this idea is that this Micah, he said, well, I, I need a priest. Well, who could I have be a priest? Oh, my son. And, and he's never going to say anything that I'm doing wrong. You know, he's not going to come to his father and say, say he's doing wrong. So, so this, this is a weird family. A very sinful family, very wicked in the eyes of God. They've they've made idols. They've done all these different things, and uh, and we see these different you know three generations here. The mom is is cursing, and the mom is dedicating money for graven images. The son is stealing from his mother, and the son has got a house full of gods. and And the grandson, the the child in this in the story, the youngest one in this story so far, is is being the priest for his own father, even though he's not of the right lineage to be a priest, and so all of them are, are in the wrong. All of them are messed up. But now we come to verse 6, and here we enter in the young man in the story that we're going to talk about today. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Well, we clearly see that from verses 1 through 5. Verse 7, And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he journeyed. And Micah said unto him, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah. I go to sojourn where I might find a place. And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me. 
and be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year, and a suit of apparel, and thy victuals. So the Levite went in. So now we have this, this Levite, a young man who is doing that which is right in his own eyes, just like the verse before said of everybody in the nation. He is not supposed to just be wandering around finding his own place. He's supposed to be uh, worshiping God in a, in a set location. He's supposed to be doing the office of a priest, but he's not. And so he's off doing his own thing. He meets another man off doing his own thing, and they make an agreement together. He says, well, I'm going to pay you. I'm going to give you a title and a position. I'm going to give you a housing allowance. I'm going to give you a salary. I'm going to give you some clothes, money for clothes. I'm going to do all this stuff for you if you'll be my priest, you'll be my father. And so he agrees to it. And uh, this is the first step down a road that's going to hurt uh, a countless number of people by the time we're done with the story. Uh, it's a, again, it's one of those things where this one family is doing wrong, this young man is doing wrong, and they get together, they were doing wrong together, and eventually it's going to hurt a whole lot more than just this one family. So verse 10, the Levite, uh, he, gets, uh, he gets this payment agreement, verse number 11, and there went from thence the family of uh, the Danites out of Zorah and out of Israel, 600 men appointed with weapons of war, and they went up and pitched in Kirjath Jerim in Judah, where before, uh, wherefore they called that place Mahadin. Uh, whoa, yeah, can't say that that fast. Unto this day, behold, it was uh, it is behind Kirjath Jerim, and they passed thence on Mount Ephraim and came to the house of Micah. So now we come to the point where the Levite has compromised what he knows right for a full time ministry job, for a room and board, for money, and through the ac actions of the Levite, we see that Micah essentially gains confidence that what he's doing is okay. And then we're going to see this new uh, group that comes in and is going to cause some trouble here in a moment, these Danites. But Micah is doing wrong. His mom is, is doing wrong. His son is doing wrong. They're all doing wrong. And here comes a Levite who is one who should be able to set them straight. And instead, he becomes the man's priest. And, and what I think happens here, what I think happens in a lot of people's cases is they, he found somebody who would justify his sin, who would justify and bring some credence to his wrongdoing. I want you to turn a couple of places in your Bible with me this morning. Matthew chapter 5, Romans chapter 6. Matthew chapter 5 and Romans chapter 6. Everybody wants somebody to agree with them for the most part. Most people, even if they say they don't care what other people think, they like to not be alone in what they're doing, what they're thinking, what they're believing. Uh, so often you see when, when a family gets upset with a church, they don't just leave. They try to take others with them, right? They, they try to make problems. They try to make it, make it a, a thing where they're joined in their efforts. So it's not just them. And uh, you, you get an argument with a friend. You go to the other friends and you try to get them on your side. And, and it's just this human nature thing of trying to get somebody to justify your actions for you. So you feel better about it. Matthew chapter 5, verse number uh, verse number 13. You're of the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost the savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and be trodden under the foot of men. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it on a bushel, but a candlestick and give it light to all that are in the house. Neither, um, sorry, ver let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works would glorify your Father in heaven. Now, Micah is doing wrong, and here comes the Levite who should set him straight, the Levite who should be a light unto him, the Levite who should know God's law and God's word and preach it, and he does none of those things. He is essentially a worthless light. He's not, he's a salt that has lost its savor. He is one of those who should be helpful to Micah, but he is not. Romans chapter 6 and verse number 4. There, therefore, we are buried uh, with him by baptism into death, like as uh, Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, uh, we should also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of a death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So often, again, just like Micah, People will want to look godly. They'll want to play the part. They'll have the little Jesus picture on the wall. They'll have the necklace or whatever. They'll wear the t-shirts. They'll do the things, but they don't want to give up their sin. They don't want to give up their lifestyle. And so they'll find a church. They'll find a preacher. They'll find Mike. They'll find the Levite man who will justify their behavior instead of 
uh, condemning their behavior. Instead of saying, thus saith the Lord, they'll say, well, you're okay. And so we're supposed to be different uh, and live differently, but yet so often there are Christians out there just like Micah, just like Levite, who they're going to do their own thing and call it Christianity. They're going to do their own thing and call it worshiping God. Micah would have probably considered himself to be a very religious man because he had a house for his gods, and he had his own priest, and he had his own ephod, and he had all these things, and boy, look at him. He must love the Lord, and yet he's doing so many things just from the few verses we have of him that are against God's law. And and today, you look around at, at the culture and different churches and denominations and different people who claim to be Christian, and they're claiming to be Christian while doing things that are against God's law. And so we, when we would stand opposed to them and say, hey, you're harming the name of Christ, you're doing wrong, they would, they'll just go down the road and find the Levite who will say, oh, you're fine, I'll be your preacher, I'll be your, you, you, you pay me, you provide for me, you give me the title and the position, and I'll just tell you whatever you want to do is fine. There's a lot of preachers like that out there. There's a lot of Christian friends like that out there. You don't have to limit this passage to just preachers. There's a lot of Christian friends and Christian influences out there that will be that Levite for the Micahs of your life. Everybody in this room probably knows somebody who claims to be Christian, but you know they're not living the way they should. You know they're not believing the way they should. You know they're not doing the things they should. And that's the thing. Are we going to be like the Levite in their life, or are we going to not be the one that says, oh, you're fine, you're justified, you're good? No, the Levite was a bad influence in this life because he brought um, confidence to his sin. Now, we started reading this tribe of Danites come in, um, and uh, they are <laughs> they're going to make a mess of Micah's life. Uh, Micah's life, but from our view, is already a mess because he's got all these different gods. He's he's got he's lying. He's stealing from his own mom. He's got his own kid and his priest. And then and then, how would you feel if you were his son? It's like, oh hey, I upgraded. I got a Levi. You're fired. <laughs> like he made his own kid as priest. And then when the Levi came in, he's like, hey, you'll be my priest. And he didn't mention anything about paying his son or giving his son a, a suit of clothes every year. But the Levi gets that. So that's again, it's just another. Another issue there with the family. And so we got all this going on. And then the Danites come and their men of war come through and they, they figure out, uh, they, they meet Micah's uh, priest here in chapter 18, uh, verse number, uh, let's, let's go down to verse number three. When they were by the house of Micah, they knew the voice of the young man, the Levite, and they turned in thither and said unto him, who brought thee hither? And what makest thou in this place? And what hast thou here? And he said unto them, Thus and thus dealeth Micah with me, and hath hired me, and I am his priest. And they said unto him, Ask counsel, we pray thee, of God, that we may know whether our way which we uh, go shall be prosperous. And the priest said unto them, Go in peace before the Lord is your way wherein ye go. So here they, they meet him. They they. They know him. The Bible says they, they knew his voice. They're figuring out there, hey, where'd you, how'd you come here? What's your situation here? He tells them, hey, this is how much my salary is. This is how much my housing allowance is. This is how many suits I get per year. And they and they inquire the Lord of him. And he, he tells them the advice, tells them what to do. Verse 7, then the five men departed and came to Laish and saw the people that were therein, how they dwelt careless. After the manner of the Zidonians, quiet and secure. And uh, there was no magistrate in the land that might put them to shame in anything. And they were far from the Zidonians and had no business with any man. And they came unto their brethren to Zorah and to Eshal, and, they, and their brethren said unto them, What say ye? And they said, Arise, that we may go up against them, for we have seen the land, and behold, it is very good. And are ye still? Be not slothful to go and to enter to possess the land. When ye go, ye shall come to a people secure and to a large land, for God hath given it into your hands, a place wherein there is no want of anything that is in the earth. And there went from thence of the family of the Danites out of the Zorah, and out of Eshtal, 600 men appointed with weapons of war. And they went up and pitched in kirjath Jerem in Judah, wherefore they called that place um, Mahadadan unto this day. Behold, it is behind kirjath Jerem. And they passed thence unto Mount Ephraim and came unto the house of Micah. So these five spies have come through. They meet Micah's priest. They get advice from him. They go, things go well. They gather, gather up all their buddies. They say, let's go take this area over. Let's go take it and claim it as our own. And on their way, here they come by the house of Micah again. 
Verse 14, Then answered the five uh, men that went to spy out the country of Laish and said unto their brethren, Do ye know that there is in these houses an ephod and a teraphim and a graven image and a molten image? Now therefore consider what ye have to do. And they turned thitherward and came to the house of the young man, the Levite, even unto the house of Micah, and saluted him. And the six hundred men appointed with their weapons of war, which were of the children of Dan, stood by the entering of the gate. And the five men that went to spy out the land went up and came in thither and took the graven image and the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image. And the priests stood in the entering of the gate with the 600 men that were appointed with weapons of war. So the priests are just standing there watching them steal everything. And and again, I hope you have a visual imagination like I do, because I'm just picturing this whole circumstance playing out in front of this house. These 600 men of war standing there. Five men are hauling out this guy's idols, this guy's gods, this guy's ephod. And his priest is just standing there. Hey, guys, what you doing? Just watching. Verse number 18. And they went into Micah's house and fetched the carved image, the ephod, and the teraphim, and the molten image. They said unto the priest unto them, what do, then said the priest unto them, what do ye? <laughs> he puts up some, some fight here. Hey, what's going on? They said unto him, hold thy peace, lay thine hand upon thy mouth, and go with us. And be to us a father and a priest. It is better for thee to be a priest in the house of one man, or that thou be a priest unto a tribe and a family in Israel. And the priest's heart was glad. And he took the ephod and the teraphim and the graven image and went in the midst of the people. So here we have this young priest who has come into Micah's life. He has validated Micah's sin by becoming his priest, even though he's a Levite who should be obeying God. He's disobeying God. He's he's helping to serve in this house that has this molten image and graven image and, and all these different things. And then as soon as he gets a better offer of a bigger audience, he's happy to just leave Micah alone and just abandon Micah and steal his gods. Now that, that's, a, that's a pretty bad preacher. That's a pretty bad, pretty bad priest. Uh, if, I were to, um, if I were to pick who I wanted to be my pastor, I would not pick somebody who was going to rob me and abandon me the first chance he got. Uh, there's a couple of things to notice, though, as we look at these verses, or as we've looked at these verses, the gods were still in their places. The Levite had not turned Micah's heart to God or taught him the truth. You would hope this story would read differently, that, the, that, the, that Micah would hire the Levite to be his priest, and the Levite would set things in order, and there'd be proper worship of God going on. But no, we, we read about all these different idols that are in the house of the gods and in the house of of Micah, it's him himself, and they're all taken out, and they're all still, but they're all still there. Uh, we see the priest has no loyalty to Micah; they're glad to abandon him when the bigger opportunity arises. Uh, we see that even though this shows the priest never really cared if Micah's home was God's will for him or not, um, he probably saw this as evidence that God was with him, because hey, God has just blessed me. He's just taken me from the household of one man to, to a whole tribe. He just gave me a big promotion. And in, isn't that what we look at, right? We look at, well, God is blessing me because I've just been promoted, or God is blessing me because I've just been given a raise or whatever. And, and yeah, praise the Lord. Give God credit for the good things in your life. But this man was going against God and doing things that were evil and doing things that were unrighteous, and he's happy when he gets this promotion. And I can, only, I can just picture other people in my life that I've met that are like this man that would say, well, look, God, God brought me to where I am today when really he just went wandering looking for a place according to his own testimony in the previous chapter. And you say, well, God, if God wasn't pleased with me, then why would he promote me? Why would he give me this opportunity? Why would he do something like this for me if he wasn't pleased with me? Not everything that happens in your life is a gift of God. Some things are... Don't, aren't aren't that God is just so happy with you? He's just going to rain down wonderful things to you. Which hey, praise the Lord if that happens. But we got to make sure that what we're doing and what we think is a promotion is actually something of God. I've met people, I've known people from church who were faithful to church, who were who were pretty solid in their beliefs, and then they got promoted, and they thought, well, because it's a promotion, because it's a good thing, it must be God blessing me, even though that promotion takes me out of church. Well, that doesn't sound right. Why would God do something for you that would keep you away from where he wants you to be? It doesn't add up. But because it was good for their pocketbook and good for their ego, 
they thought, well, God must be blessing me with this. And so they left church to do the promotion, and, and now, they, now they're gone. And so we got to be careful that just because something good comes along, we don't immediately attribute it like, oh, this must be God's will because look what it's going to do for me. There's, there's a lot of, you can get in a lot of trouble going and chasing after those, you know, get rich quick schemes. They, I feel like I don't see them as often anymore, but I remember hearing things on the radio and seeing things online all the time about, you know, oh, if you're still working five days a week, you're, you're a fool and all this different stuff. And I saw something the other day, this, this person who is a preacher of some kind um, was putting online these, these essentially anti-work posts saying that you're a fool if you worked for, for the corporations and all this and you're going to die having never lived and there's a better way. And imagine uh, something, the effect of imagine uh, waking up knowing that your bills are paid even if you don't get out of bed. Like, so I, so I just put, I put, uh, six days shalt thou work and do all thy labor. One of the, one of that's the 11th commandment, right? The seven, the, the, the commandment of resting of the Sabbath day includes six days shalt thou work. Now, most of us don't work six days. We work five days because that's the way America typically works. But I put that on there and, uh, and I forget what he, the response was, you know, some kind of backpedaling thing. But it's this idea of, hey, you don't have to work to get rich. That has never really been something of God. When God says that you ought to work or you don't eat, when God says you ought to provide for your own or you're worse than an infidel, then if somebody gives you some get rich quick thing, then it's probably not of God. So all that to say, this this man, this young man, he saw something that he that was good for him. He saw something that was beneficial to him, and I can imagine that he probably took it as a sign from God that it was time to leave Micah and move on to bigger things. Now, it to me, it gets really funny here in the next few verses because I'm not living this, and I don't have much compassion for Micah. But but to me, it's it's entertaining. So you see, verse 21. So they turned and departed. And put the little ones and the cattle and the carriage before them. And when they were a good way away from the house of Micah, the men that were in the houses near to Micah's house were gathered together and overtook the children of Dan. And they cried unto the children of Dan, and they turned their faces and said unto Micah, What aileth thee, and that thou comest with such a company? So these men that just stole his priests and all his gods say, Hey, what's your problem? <laughs> it's just the weirdest passage. It's the weirdest situation. He said, "Ye have taken away my gods, which I made, and the and and the priest, and ye are gone away. And what have I more? And what is this that ye say unto me? What aileth thee?" He says, "What are you talking about? You've stolen the gods which I made." Now that that phrase right there is all you need to know. You've taken the gods I made. That's one of the problems with making your own gods. If it's not a true and living God. If it's not the one true and living God, then hey, if it's just this, if if my God is this little flag here, if I bow down and worship this little flag here, and Brother Ken comes and holds a gun to my head and steals his flag, I can't do nothing about it. Well, I probably could because I have one of my own. But but if we, but but the idea is this man made his own gods, and they were a physical item that he worshipped, and so that item could just be stolen away. And how would you feel if your gods allowed themselves, gods that you made, allowed themselves to be stolen away from you? That's not a very loving God. That's not a very nice God. That's a pretty weak God to just be stolen. And so this whole passage is a great testament to the fact that gods that we create are no gods at all. That the, the gods that people make up are not true and living gods. And that idol worship is just foolishness when you look at it logically. But I rest my case. Now, verse number uh, verse number 25, And the children of Dan said unto him, Let not thy voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows run upon thee, and thou lose thy life with the lives of thy household. That's a pretty good threat. He says, uh, We better not hear your voice, or somebody, some angry person, is going to kill you. So he gets his priest. His priest runs off with a better offer. The men steal, steal his gods that he created, his ephod that he made, all these things that were the work of his own hands, but that he worshipped as God. And when he complains, they say, be quiet or you will die. 
Verse number 26, And the children of Dan went their way, and when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back unto his house. Not much you can do when the enemy is too strong for you. Now, turn with me to Psalm 115. Psalm 115. This is something you should bookmark in your Bible. If you underline, you should underline it. If you, if you try to memorize verses still, you should do that. Everybody ought to memorize verses. We know that, but not everybody still tries. Sometimes the old memory banks don't work so well anymore, and putting in new information causes a malfunction. <laughs> I, I've experienced that myself a couple times. Put, try to put too much new information in, and it comes out all twisted and wrong. Psalm 115, verse number 4. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. That's exactly what we have in, Mike, in Micah's house. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. So, so it's a good thing to remember where that is to, so, to see if your God is not the one true living God, then that's what you worship. Something that may, it may have an eye, but it doesn't see. It may have a nose, but it doesn't smell. It have, may have feet, but it can't come to your aid because it can't move. You've got to pick it up and carry it out if your house burns down. You've got to save your, your God if that's the case. And so uh, you may never meet an idol worshiper outside of uh, what we would meet uh, uh, every day or of the year in people that wear idols around their neck and pray to idols every week and light candles in front of idols and they, they think it's okay because their idols have names from the Bible like Mary and Jesus and Saint so-and-so. Um, other than those people, you probably won't meet an idol worshiper uh, here in America, but you, you might. And, uh, and people, a lot of people like what I just mentioned. They don't realize they're worshiping idols and you can just tell them, hey, that statue can't help you. And the person that statue represents don't know you. <laughs> yeah, this idea that, that these people that have died in the faith years and years ago are, are doing things for us today is nowhere in Scripture. When I die and go to heaven, I'm sorry. I love y'all, but you're on your own. I'm with the Lord. I'm, I'm doing whatever, whatever gets done in heaven. That's what I'm doing. I'm not worrying about your prayers, and I'm not listening to your prayers because if I could hear your prayers and your struggles and your trials then the Bible saying there's no more tears in heaven would be a lot. So you think about that. Anyways, we don't want to get into that. People get mad when you talk about the, the church that I'm talking about. I use the word church very loosely there, but it's the fact. Now, in the qualification for pastor, this, this Levite, he was a young man, and he made some horrible mistakes, some bad decisions. He essentially went after whatever biggest title he could get, biggest crowd he could get, biggest payday he could get. He didn't care about what God's law said. He didn't care about the people that he was serving with the Micah's house. He just, whatever was best for him, that's what he went after. And we have some warnings about young people in Scripture when it comes to um, the pastorate even. In 1 Timothy 3.6, the Bible says, Not a novice, lest being, up, being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now, I know I say this as a young preacher. I, I started preaching at 15. I became a youth pastor at 18, became a pastor at something, 29. And I'm trying to do my math in my head here. And so I know I'm a younger guy, um, not necessarily according to Bible standards, but according to today's standards. Um, but as something you got to be careful of. There are, there are young people out there that they're going to make these mistakes because they're novices, because they're young and, and they don't have necessarily the right guidance in their life, maybe. And so this young man, this young Levite, he left where he should have been. He left the people that should have been guiding him and he went off to find his own way. That sounds a lot like young people today. I'm just going to leave home and I'll find my own way, find my own place. I'm going to find myself. Well, look in the mirror. There you are. I, I've heard that phrase so many times. I just, I try not to laugh at people. Like, I get it. You know, I'm going to go find myself. You're going to figure out what you like and all that. I get all that. But look in the mirror. There you are. Congratulations. You found yourself. It's not that hard. And so this, man, this young man, he goes off to, to find his place and, uh, and it, it does not go well. God's word and God's way is above our own preferences. That's the first thing we need to know when we look at this man. He he didn't he seemingly did not care what God's law was, because if he did, then right there in the Ten Commandments, he could tell the guy, don't steal from your mom. He could tell the mom, don't make graven images. It, there's, there's several things just right there 
that he could he could be setting them straight on, but he doesn't. All the idols are still there later on in the next chapter. Uh, Proverbs 16, 25, there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Our own preferences, our own way is a dangerous way. We need to go God's way. We need to make sure that our way is in line with what his way is. Always, always, always. Just because man gives a title and a paycheck doesn't mean you're a man of God. No, that's for the preachers. That's for the teachers. That's for, for the people in ministry. Just because you have a position in ministry doesn't mean you're automatically right in everything that you do. I mean, that, that should be clear and obvious, but I've met a couple of people who have the mindset of, well, if I do it, it must be right. And well, no, you are not God reincarnate. <laughs> you are not infallible. And sadly, that I have seen that attitude more in seasoned preachers than I've seen it in young preachers. Because the young preachers, for the most part, know that they're terrified out of their minds and they don't know what they're doing and they know that some of these people they're preaching to have, have been in church longer than they've been alive and it gives them a little bit of humility sometimes. Sometimes I hear these big-name preachers preach and it's just like they must think they're God. Because their way is, is their way or their highway. None of what they say is ever opinion. It's always straight from the Word of God, even if they don't have a verse for it. <laughs> Anybody ever heard a preacher like that? You better not question them because they're the man of God. Okay, man of God, show me a verse. So we got to be careful. This Levite teaches us that, teaches us our own way and preferences not above God's way. And then uh, when the pastor, the teacher, or even just the saved friend uh, as this Le Levite did, do, do as this Levite did and justify somebody else's sin or validate somebody else's sin or even just ignore somebody else's sin, we all end up causing harm. Because this tribe of the Danites, you think about this man was not willing to set one household straight. This, this priest was not willing to go to one household and say this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong. We have no record of him doing anything to fix that household. Now, he's the priest for the entire tribe of Dan. So now he's taken that mindset of whatever they do is okay with me and therefore okay with God. And he's applied that now not to just one home, but to a whole tribe of Israel. And so when we have bad habits in our lives, when we have, make a bad habit of not intervening, of not standing up for the truth, of not speaking up when led to of the Holy Spirit, uh, then that can cause so much more harm than we realize. Because we can, by our silence, we can be perceived as condoning things. And uh, so I, as a pastor especially, I, I know I have to speak up more often than not because I don't want somebody to think, well, he didn't say anything, so it must be okay. Anybody ever been in that situation where you know, like you're on the job, you're at school, whatever it is, you're somewhere where there's a bunch of lost people around and something happens and they all just look at you to see what is that, per what is that Christian person going to do? Are they going to stay quiet? And if they do, then I'm going to assume that means that that's okay because they didn't say anything about it. And so we got to be careful. We can't be like this Levite, this young man who seemingly did not do any part of the job of a priest except what he was told by those who were supplying him with the paycheck and the suit of clothes and the place to stay. And that's not the kind of, that's a hireling. That's not the shepherd. That's not the preacher. That's not what you want. Uh, in your church, and that's not what you want yourself to be, to your friends, to your family members, to your coworkers. You want to be somebody who, if there's something wrong, you'll tell them out of love, hey, this is what God's Word says. You don't want to just be that, that young Levite. He's got a lot of bad things about him that we can learn from. Hopefully, uh, something's been helpful this morning. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your Word. Uh, thank you for the different young people in the Bible we can study, Lord. Some of them good, some of them bad. And Lord, help us to take the lessons that we've seen in this passage and, and judges, Lord, and understand, Lord, that you are the one true God, that we ought to be serving you, and Lord, that we ought to be a shining light, Lord, that we ought not let darkness prevail in our lives and go unchallenged. Lord, help us to make sure that we are speaking out for the righteousness of you, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.